we got a separate project started in the village of Gardenville, New York, in, an, in a, what had been a garage. And here we are illustrating the design part of the project. There's our first transmission drawing. And then, more important, we had an excellent shop right there where we could uh, make the actual parts for the helicopter. For instance, here's our assembly of the first uh, machine. That tail boom was made in a nearby Bell plant. Here is a landing gear very similar to the landing gear that we had on that model, which you saw. Now here we're removing the shaft from the tail boom. Uh, and we had just been running it up to see if it was OK and the bearings would work and so forth. That pulley to the left there was used to drive it up to full speed and make sure we had no resonance. There's a pretty good view of the garage as a whole and the first uh, test bed really taking shape. There's the mechanism that the first machine had its stabilizer bar, and of course, above it, the hub, ready to accept the blades. The blades were very similar, by the way, to the model blades. Now, we used very few drawings when we came to things like the fuselage, which was mostly plywood beams, and uh, we improvised as we went along, of course. Naturally, we had to have drawings for control parts and transmission and so forth, but uh, for instruments, and uh, things we considered uh, uh, unimportant for tolerance purposes, we simply improvised as we went along. Now here's the same boy who had learned how to make the model blades in mass production, uh, making full-scale blades to almost exactly the same design. They're solid wood, that cam causes the saw to uh, follow, make an airfoil shape. Uh, the leading edge has a metal insert as the model blades had had. We made two different airfoil sections before we were through, the 0012 and also a 23012, which was not as easy to uh, uh, smooth out as 0012. Now here's a shot we made later to illustrate to Bell engineers what was involved inside the helicopter and it shows parts of the transmission in the very first machine. This is the freewheeling, which uh, those of you who know Model 47 will recognize right away, except that instead of 16 slots, we later had to go to 32 slots for those rollers. Now, Arthur had thought that Bell would be able to provide him with transmission designers who would know far more than he did. But uh, to his surprise, uh, they, Bell was unable to help at all with the transmission. So Arthur merely made a, a copy of his same transmissions he'd used in the little models. But this is six times larger in size, otherwise almost identical to the model techniques. The transmission is a double planetary with free floating pinions. Here the uh, freewheeling is almost assembled, and as you see, it is the ring gear for one of the stages of the double planetary, so that in one direction it was perfectly free and in the other direction it would lock up, similar to the coaster brake on a bicycle. Now, here are the two planetary stages. The one on top happens to be the lower one at, lower, at higher RPM and lower torque, and the uh, bigger pinions on the bottom of the upper stage driving the mast. <coughs> now, every new uh, project, of course, has to have a ceremony of rollout with dignitaries, and we had to have ours. So uh, came the day exactly six months after we